Cultural Club. We welcome you to this evening's discussion on the Saudi invasion of Bahrain, the road to regional instability. And we're delighted to welcome our three speakers this evening, uh, Professor Madawi Al-Rashid, Professor Joshua uh, Castellino, and Mr. Jawad <coughs> Farouz. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Al-Rashid first. Um, Professor Al-Rashid's uh, title this evening is Saudi Arabia Local and Regional Challenges. Uh, she is a Saudi Arabian-born professor of social anthropology at the Department of Theology and Religious Studies in King's College, London, and she has had that position since 1994. She gives occasional lectures in the United States, Europe, and the Middle East, and is working on religio-political debates in Saudi Arabia after uh, the 11th of September, 9-11. She has written several books and articles in academic journals in the Arabian Peninsula, Arab Migration, Globalization, and Religious Transnationalism. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, thank you uh, for inviting me to share some of my thoughts on uh, what's going on in the Arab world, but with specific reference to Saudi Arabia. Uh, you have to bear with me, I'm suffering from a cold, but uh, hopefully I will not lose my voice. Uh, let me start first by uh, uh, surveying what has happened over the last two years um, and focus uh, specifically on Saudi reactions to the Arab uprisings. Um, I think there are three reactions that have come out of Saudi Arabia with respect to the uh, challenging uh, situation in many Arab countries from North Africa to Syria. And these, there are three strategies that the Saudi regime has adopted since uh, 2011. The first one is containment, second one is counter-revolution, and the third one is revolution. So Saudi Arabia initially was described as a counter-revolutionary force in, in, uh, during the Arab uprising, but I think that is not an accurate uh, description. In fact, it had these three uh, uh, positions uh, depending on its own national interest um, in the region. Uh, so uh, initially, obviously Saudi Arabia would have preferred the regime, the Arab regimes to stay as they are um, and condemn the revolts um, and their transformative nature uh, in anticipation of uh, the upheavals that are going to that were going to be uh, uh, witnessed in the region, they uh, immediately instructed their religious followers to uh, ban demonstrations and call them fitna dissent, invoking a long uh, Islamic uh, heritage especially within the Sunni tradition that prohibits peaceful protest and civil disobedience. Uh, the official press highlighted these fatwas of the religious scholars and uh, called them uh, uh, ways of mitigating against chaos and uh, the resulting uncertainty of the future. So uh, from the very beginning, Saudi religious scholars condemned uh, Muhammad Bouazizi when he set himself alight on the 4th of January. Uh, sparking the widespread revolt in, in Tunisia um, and that, that uh, spread across the Arab world. Uh, Saudi Arabia immediately offered refuge to President Zain Abdin bin Ali on the 14th of January 2011 and ignored uh, calls for his repatriation. Foreign Minister Saud al Faisal justified this by invoking Arab hospitality. Uh, while Tunisia was important to Saudi Arabia, uh, for the security and intelligence links that uh, uh, the Ministry of Interior in Saudi Arabia established with its equivalent in Tunisia, it is, uh, Tunisia itself is hardly central to Saudi security um, uh, or influence in North Africa. Um, Tunisia is important for its own people, but it is actually more important for Europe than for Saudi Arabia, with the exception of these links that linked Saudi Arabia to the Tunisian regime. Um, and eventually, the uh, victory of Rashid Ghanoushi, his Islamist al-Nahda party, 
uh, was uh, received with dismay in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Ghanoushi had previously be deni been denied entry into the country and remained aloof from the Saudi leadership during his years in exile here in London. During the uprising, his daughter, Sumeya, attacked Saudi Arabia's authoritarian rule and its hosting of Bin Ali. Um, after his election victory, uh, Ranoushi denounced the hypocrisy prevalent in countries such as Saudi Arabia while explaining his uh, uh, Islamic program, which so far has not made it compulsory for uh, Tunisians to uh, enforce Islamic law. He said that Tunisian women who wear the veil do so voluntarily while explaining that in countries where veiling is compulsory, women take the first opportunity to remove it, a subtle, a subtle reference to Saudi Arabia. Um, when we come to uh, <coughs> and the, the future development in Tunisia, we see that Saudi Arabia, um, uh, uh, through its foreign ministry, um, uh, the, the minister, Hamadi uh, Jibali, did not visit Saudi Arabia until February 2012. And um, moderate uh, Tunisian Islamism presented a challenge to Saudi Arabia. One may argue that a country that claims to rule according to Islamic law and uh, boasts about Islamic credential is actually the, the country that feels the threat of the rise of Islamism in countries like uh, Tunisia and beyond, especially in Egypt. Um, so the, the official Saudi uh, press offered a platform for Tunisian uh, ancien regimes uh, activists to highlight the restrictions on personal liberties. So if you survey the Saudi newspapers and the media, you'd find that they give a platform for all critics of the existing regime now in, in Tunisia by showing how it tends to restrict personal liberties as if in Saudi Arabia those personal liberties are actually respected. Um, so in, in, in contrast to that, uh, we see that in, in the uh, uh, case of Egypt, the real challenge was actually felt by Saudi Arabia, given that Mubarak was uh, the closest ally of the regime. So uh, Saudi Arabia could not offer sanctuary to uh, deposed Egyptian uh, President Hosni Mubarak although the regime would probably have liked to do so. After Mubarak stepped down uh, on the 12th of Feb February 2011, Saudi Arabia promised the Egyptian armed forces, forces aid worth of uh, four billions. Uh, during Mubarak's initial exile in Sharm el-Sheikh, unsubstantiated rumors circulated that Saudis were plotting his escape, but obviously nothing happened. Uh, the first round of election resulted, as expected, in victory for the Muslim Brotherhood and, um, and for the Salafi party. Um, in a way, Saudi Arabia could no longer count on Egypt backing, uh, Egypt's backing in the Arab region. The new openness in the Egyptian public sphere, including the media, has ended the silence over the country's previous subservience to Saudi agenda. In particular, some uh, med Egyptian media, uh, um, who uh, from that moment of, uh, of the Arab uprising began to be more open and chose to report openly on uh, those Egyptians who were defying uh, Saudi uh, presence in Egypt. Also, there were demonstrations in front of the Saudi embassy um, and calls for the uh, uh, Egyptian foreign ministry to take action to protect citizens, uh, Egyptian citizens in Saudi Arabia. Um, Saudi Arabia had rewarded the Mubarak regime for silencing criticism of Saudi Arabia and for long-term intelligence and diplomatic cooperation, and also had enjoyed Egypt's support against Iran. Uh, today, over one million Egyptians work in Saudi Arabia, and uh, uh, while that uh, uh, some of that number of Egyptian immigrants in Saudi Arabia would actually cause a problem if it is returned to Saudi Arabia, uh, exactly like what happened during the 90, early 1990s when Saudi Arabia uh, expelled over one million Yemeni immigrants. Uh, because of their regime's support, at least in rhetoric, for Saddam Hussein. So, uh, 
as long as Egypt remains economically weak and politically unstable, which is actually the case now, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia could assume that uh, uh, or hope that it would remain uh, or bring back Egypt to the Saudi uh, sphere of influence. Um, notwithstanding Saudi fears of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the Saudi regime will try to contain the outcome of the Egyptian revolt through subsidies, backdoor diplomacy, and cooperation with the military and intelligence services of Egypt. Um, now, the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood itself uh, have made it clear that the organization does not aim to export the Egyptian revolt to Gulf Cooperation Council to the GCC countries and would honor Gulf investment made before the revolution. The Egyptian courts will investigate only suspicious investment made under Mubarak regime. There were a lot of land that was sold to uh, Gulf uh, investors at a very, very uh, unfair price, and they will probably pursue uh, the legal route in order to regain some of their uh, assets. Uh, however, the, today, the most effective weapon against the development uh, of um, um, uh, a stable Egypt is, uh, in fact, to continue to uh, back groups that would destabilize Egypt. And one mistake that people make usually is the assumption that the Saudi regime would always um, uh, sponsor Salafi groups. But this is actually not, tr uh, not accurate because the Saudis, given that their resources, would actually bet on many horses. So it is very likely that they would support some Salafi groups, but at the same time they would support some of the regime, uh, the, the activists today, who have been aligned with the Mubarak regime, just in case one group uh, wins. So it is a strategy of uh, co-opting or uh, subsidizing multiple groups in a foreign country in order to come with a, a, a solution or with a positive benefit to the Saudi regime. Now we come to the third case. I've talked so far about Tunisia and Egypt, but let's see what's happened, what happened in Libya and what the situation, what the position response of Saudi Arabia was at the time. Saudi Arabia initially remained silent on Libya, although it uh, had a very troubled relationship with Gaddafi. But Gaddafi and Libya was not an immediate uh, threat to Saudi Arabia, and the uprising promised to remove an arch enemy, and that was that. While Qatar, the UAE, and Jordan nominally participated in the heavy NATO bombing that brought down Gaddafi's regime, Saudi Arabia only offered a verbal backing. The participation of Gulf states ensured that the Libyan revolt could be easily contained, and Gaddafi's downfall could only serve Saudi interests. Saudi Arabia had another, more menacing uh, uprising to deal with nearer to home, and this was in Yemen. Saudi Arabia has long considered Yemen a security threat um, and has interfered in its local politics since the 1930s. In addition to direct intervention and subsidies to tribal chiefs and activists in and the regime, Saudi Arabia was cooperating militarily with the Yemeni uh, uh, military establishment. It had participated in bombing Zaydis in Sana'a in 2009 in support of President Ali Abdullah Saleh. It also sponsored Salafi groups and institutions in the heartland of Yemen, created, uh, creating internal tension and schism within that society. From 2005, Saudi Arabia succeeded in expelling Al-Qaeda operatives, compounding Yemeni problems with militant Islamism. In January 2011, when Yemenis took to Tahrir Square in Sana'a to overthrow Saleh, Saudi Arabia was alarmed and immediately attempted to control the revolt. Under the umbrella of the GCC, Saudi Arabia designed the Yemeni Accord, and I think here we have more Yemeni specialists who could tell us more about this than myself, but I just mentioned that this guaranteed Saleh's immunity in return for a transfer of power to the vice president. Saleh delayed signing, but eventually he was given medical treatment in Saudi Arabia after an assassination attempt and remained there for a while before returning to Sana'a en route to the United States for further treatment. While the Yemeni uprising was too complex for the Saudis to micromanage, 
demonstrations where uh, demonstrators uh, were aware of Saudi interventions supporting all the Yemeni tribal groups, uh, veteran activists, and Saleh's regime uh, and its military figures. On one occasion, they chanted uh, the Yemeni demonstrator, Al Yemen Mush al Bahrain, and we, I'll come to Bahrain in a minute, uh, clearly denouncing Saudi intervention and reminding the Saudi leadership that the Yemen would not be so easy to dominate. At the time of uh, uh, just uh, finishing my, my talk and writing it, it seems that Saudi Arabia succeeded in preventing the worst, mainly an unpredictable and hostile political climate. Hadi was elected president in 2012, but the previous Yemeni regime remains intact. I cannot see that anything has changed in Yemen. In addition to the troubled border, border area between Saudi Arabia and Yemen, uh, the Al-Qaeda threat and the Houthis in the north, Saudi Arabia wanted to maintain its influence in Yemen by promoting a counter-revolution disguised uh, as negotiation. It is only in Bahrain and I come here to Bahrain. <coughs> it is only in Bahrain that Saudi Arabia pursued military intervention, and that is direct military intervention, rather than negotiation or backdoor diplomacy and cooptation for its own internal reasons. Saudi Arabia was determined to preserve uh, monarchies in the GCC states and score a victory over Iran in Bahrain. On the 14th of February, um, protesters marched to Perth Square in Yemen, where security forces struggled to control the situation. The GCC states forged a policy to thwart the revolt and support the Sunni al Khalifa rulers. This swift response confirmed Saudi Arabia as a counter revolutionary force in the region. The Bahrain government continues to cement its um, GCC connections and aspires to equip. Confederation of Gulf State. In fact, it is the only uh, GCC state that uh, calls for a quick uh, confederation or some kind of uh, strong connect stronger connections with other GCC states. Kuwait is very hesitant and definitely has not expressed any kind of uh, desire to be part to enforce a further unity between Gulf uh, states. Oman also has remained aloof and did not want to get even more entrenched in GCC politics. Um, the UAE has certain problems with Saudi Arabia, especially economic ones, over a uh, common currency and the, uh, uh, the central Gulf Bank that was proposed. Uh, Bahr uh, UAE wants it to be based in Dubai, and Saudi Arabia wants it to be based in Riyadh. And therefore, it's very difficult to see how the other GCC countries um, with the exception of Bahrain, called for a greater uh, unity uh, with regimes. I think the best critique came from the head of the uh, uh, dissolved Kuwaiti parliament, Saadun, who said that we cannot be in, uh, in further unity with uh, 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 unelected, uh, unelected uh, parliamentary systems, meaning Saudi Arabia. Um, so, in 2011, during the GCC summit, King Abdullah announced that they should move towards this cooperation uh, and change it into a union. Um, and Bahrain agreed enthusiastically. In contrast, the Kuwaitis, as I said, rejected that. Now, the rulers of Bahrain continue to claim that the revolt was driven by an Iranian conspiracy to undermine Sunni rule, a line which appeals to the Saudi regime. Yet a Bahraini, all Bahraini reports uh, uh, dismissed any kind of connections uh, with the outside world, mainly Iran. Uh, Saudi Arabia now uh, phase, uh, moved into Bahrain really for two reasons. One of them is to, uh, to prevent the downfall of the Al Khalifa, because it would have been the first precedent in the Gulf where the monarchy is no longer there. And you only need to have one uh, falling and possibly the fear of the domino effect in the region might actually start. So that was the first main concern. The second concern is domestic, and this has to do with Saudi internal um, um, uh, situation. Uh, well, all of you know that only 16 kilometers separate Bahrain from the oil fields. 
of Saudi Arabia and with a population in the eastern province that is uh, uh, that has a high concentration concentration of Shia um, uh, there. And these um, have, have had uh, historical kinship, economic, political, and social connections. Um, and uh, as predicted, after the Bahraini uh, revolt, the Sambi Shia started their agitations in, in the eastern province. Um, and one would argue that uh, Saudi Arabia has actually succeeded in enforcing a sectarian rift between um, the majority in Saudi Arabia and the, Sunni, the Shia minority in the eastern province and in Bahrain. And uh, it served its purposes to present the Bahraini uprising as a Shia uh, uprising backed by a, a foreign country, Iran, in order to gain some kind of internal legitimacy. The Saudis uh, has, have struggled for several, for almost thir three decades to present themselves as the defenders of Sunni Islam. And um, as the internal situation was shifting in Saudi Arabia, we witnessed over the last two years more mobilization among the Sunnis, uh, the last of which was actually in the heartland of Wahhabi Islam, in the Qasim, in Burega, uh, where there is a serious mobilization um, by different groups calling for rights and uh, the rights of political prisoners. And in order to suppress that revolt, the, uh, sectarian, <coughs> the sectarian discourse, the sectarian agitation is extremely important. <coughs> so let me just conclude as I can't uh, talk anymore. Thank you. <coughs> just a, a few concluding remarks. What I want to say is it is ironic that a state claiming to rule according to Islamic principles, Saudi Arabia fears the power of Islamism, both at home and in neighboring countries. Two regional Islamist trends worry Saudi Arabia. One is the Muslim Brotherhood, and then the second one is the Salafis, who have decided to engage in politics through elections and democratic institutions, such as, for example, what happened in uh, Egypt. We may agree or disagree with that, but uh, they uh, present us with a model that the Saudis don't want to see. Saudi Salafis, uh, especially the official Salafiyya, uh, built its reputation and built its strength on the basis that uh, de democracy and election are all uh, unacceptable. Uh, so Saudi legitimacy is based on appropriating Islamic symbols such as claims that our constitution is the Quran and the application of Sharia. Countries where <coughs> secular dictators have been deposed are now adopting moderate Islamic slogans. Their newly elected parliaments have Islamist majorities drawn from both the Brotherhood and the Salafis. The Saudi leader leadership is losing its unique Islamic credential and is eager to contain the uprising in such a way as to remain the only Islamic model in the region, so-called Islamic model in the region. The, the possibility of neighboring states combining Islamic politics with democracy threatens this Saudi model and hence seriously alarms the Saudi government. What worries the Saudi regime most is the transformation that its own Islamists are undergoing. Many Saudi Islamists are now espousing the global discourse on human rights, civil rights, um, and there are many groups working on the ground uh, trying to uh, uh, gain some kind of uh, existence and recognition. But unfortunately, just on Saturday, the uh, leadership of this trend in Saudi Arabia associated with uh, civil and uh, uh, political right association were uh, sentenced to 10 and 11 year in prison. And these are Abdullah al-Hamid and uh, Hamad al-Qahtani. So in the, I think just to, uh, uh, a point about the future. In the near future, Saudi Arabia will face serious upheavals as its own Islamist, liberal activist, and also its Shia minority, uh, in addition to the unpoliticized citizens, continue to demand real political reform um, at a time when the leadership is concerned with its own succession problems. Uh, 
Saudi Arabia lost several uh, uh, princes over the last two years, and it is this transitional period when the uh, uh, the uh, divisions within the ro within the royal family and the management of the succession is unfolding. We find that this population itself is developing uh, uh, and empowering itself by the discourse on human rights and uh, civil liberties. <coughs> Uh, now, uh, how the Saudi would uh, actually um, uh, re respond to the events in Bahrain, I think given the, re the international silence over the situation in Bahrain, Saudi Arabia will remain there for the foreseeable future. And only if there are some serious changes in Saudi Arabia, I can't see these troops out of Bahrain. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Professor Al Rashid. We will take questions after we've heard from uh, Professor Castellino and uh, Jawad Farouz. So uh, hold your questions uh, for a little bit longer. But thank you very much. I'm going to invite uh, Professor Joshua Castellino to speak uh, <coughs> next. Um, his title is The Saudi Invasion from the Perspective of International Law. Uh, professor Castellino is the Professor of Law and Dean of the School of Law at Middlesex University, London, and the Adjunct Professor of Law at the Irish Centre for Human Rights, Galway, in Ireland. Uh, Joshua worked as a journalist in Mumbai in the Indian Express Group and was awarded the Chevening Scholarship in, to pursue an MA in International Law and Politics in 1995 completed his PhD in international law in 1998. He's authored seven books in international law and human rights law on self-determination, title of territory, and indigenous people's rights, uh, besides several articles on a range of other legal subtopics. We welcome uh, Professor Castellino to speak next. <coughs> Friends, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, especially thank the Gulf Cultural Club and uh, Dr. Saeed and Zainab Mufta for inviting me to, to speak to you today. Uh, essentially, I, I also want to start by paying tribute to the people in Bahrain and places like Syria who have continued their struggle despite, at times, the international society's complete decision to ignore the struggles there and really fighting against quite impossible odds. What I want to speak to you about today is really to give you an international legal perspective on some of the issues that are, we are faced with in the context of these events of two years ago that continue to these days. Essentially, I want to speak to you about five concepts I think that you will hear in the context of the Saudi, the Saudi action in Bahrain. The first concept I want to touch on is, is the concept of sovereignty and what it means. The second is to say a little bit about self-determination and what that particular concept means and how important it is in public international law. I want to address briefly the issue of humanitarian intervention. And the reason I do that is because it's often suggested that what took place two years ago was a humanitarian intervention by one Gulf state coming to the assistance of another. I want to tell you what the international legal position is on humanitarian intervention. I want to touch on a fourth concept called the responsibility to protect, again, which is very similar to the humanitarian uh, law concept. And finally, I want to talk to you a little bit about the right of peace. So these are five international legal concepts that I think you, we ought to really highlight in the context of understanding the impact of these events of two years ago that continue to this day. I start with sovereignty because sovereignty is a crucial element of the architecture in international law. Sovereignty essentially is, is nothing other than the right of any government to have complete jurisdiction over the territory it governs. And basically what sovereignty is, is a concept to allow every independent state to stand on its own two feet. In the context of decolonization, one of the real fears, as many states in Asia, Africa, and Latin America came to independence, one of the big fears that these states had was interference. 
Interference from powerful states, very often powerful western states who drew their boundaries, but also interference from other states nearby who may have had strong interests. If you remember the United Nations Charter, it talks about we the people of the United Nations having solemnly urged to constitute ourselves into an international society. It highlights the principle of sovereignty. And really the idea of sovereignty in that context is we will always oppose the interference by one sovereign state in the affairs of another sovereign state. And that's important to bear in mind. It's articulated in legal terms in something called Article 27 of the United Nations Charter, which says that nothing contained in the Charter will allow a sovereign state to interfere in matters of the, in the domestic jurisdiction of another sovereign. Let's leave sovereignty aside for a moment, because essentially you could say sovereignty is really a concept which protects governments. What about people? Because you could argue that, in a sense, if the Bahraini government is a sovereign state, and everybody acknowledges it is, then surely the Bahraini government can decide who it wants to invite in at a time of crisis. And that's an argument that's often made to justify Saudi intervention in Bahrain. And I'll come back to that concept in a minute. But I'd like to reiterate at this stage that sovereignty needs to be understood in the context of the sovereignty of the government, but also the sovereignty of the people. And that different rules apply when there is something of a protest going on, when there is really a mass uprising for which you can gain popular support. If we leave that aside for, for a second and move to the second concept, which is really the notion of the right of self-determination. In the creation of international society as we know it now, the right of self-determination was highlighted as being fundamental. Essentially, this was the right that allowed us to go from the 45 member states of the United Nations who signed the Charter in 1945, the 51 old members, to the 200 member states we have now. Self-determination was a process through which many peoples all over the world stood up for their rights, claimed those rights in an international context, gained sometimes implicit and explicit support, including the use of armed force, to gain their own sovereignty and their own rights. For me, self-determination here is the material issue in Bahrain. What we see across the, across the Arab world, starting from Tunisia, is really the first time that we are listening to the voice of the Arab people. It is a real shame that when we are listening to this voice of the Arab people, we are allowing this noise to be drowned out by other voices that don't speak for the Arab people. Decolonization was essentially a process through which colonial states who had a presence in Arab, uh, in African, in Asian, in Latin American lands were asked to leave and abdicate. What ought to have happened if we followed the United Nations principles was that a true voice of the people ought to have been heard and we ought to have been able to create independent states. That of course happened in many parts of the world but didn't really happen in the Middle East where essentially decolonization and self-determination simply meant the handover of power from one colonial ruler to another non-representative ruler. So the key element here is to what extent is the uprising all across the Middle East a cry for self-determination, a genuine plea on the part of people to have rights that are due to everyone by virtue of being human. And for me, what we see in the, in the, in the Middle East across, and many our countries in North Africa too, what we see really is a, an att attempt to give voice to a frustration that exists by people who have been disempowered and excluded from power for a long time. Failing to hear those voices is really akin to saying self-determination does not matter. So for me, self-determination is a second concept to bear in mind. Moving on to the third concept then, humanitarian intervention. It's often said at a time of crisis that you need to have your friends beside you to help you get through it. And humanitarian intervention was really a concept that was designed and has been existing throughout centuries by which one state would come to the assistance of another state in when that state is faced with an invasion. Usually humanitarian intervention took place when a foreign government was invading a country and when there was a genuine uh, threat to the lives and livelihood of the population. Increasingly though, what has happened is that humanitarian intervention has been used as a political motivation to interfere in the sovereign affairs of another state based on real politique and based on the kinds of considerations that the previous speaker highlighted in terms of Saudi Arabian policy. It is really important to distinguish when there is an hour of need 
and when there is a need to defend the people, and when there is, quite differently, an attempt to further your foreign policy through the invasion of another sovereign country. We need to distinguish those concepts because getting that wrong can lead to material consequences. The United Nations has been greatly concerned about the extent to which humanitarian intervention could be legal. Various different states at various different points have suggested when they, when they have invaded another country that what they are doing is responding to a humanitarian need. So humanitarian intervention has become a political tool that can be used by the powerful to get their political interests. In the interest of trying to refine this concept further, in the international legal community, the concept was developed of responsibility to protect. R2P for short, responsibility to protect. Essentially, this was the argument that says that the international community has a responsibility to citizens all over the world to protect them from the gross human rights violations that may occur, irrespective of whether those violations occur as a result of a foreign invasion or actions by their own state. The responsibility to protect essentially creates an obligation on the part of international society to take action when there are gross human rights violations at stake. Just to give you an idea where this responsibility to protect emerges from, it really emerges in the aftermath of the Rwanda genocide. If you look at the United Nations Charter, one quick way of explaining it is it's an attempt to make sure that genocide never occurs again. Even in the UN Charter preamble, it talks about the scourge of genocide that has twice visited us in our lifetimes and makes a pledge never to let it happen again. That was 1945. But 1945 was not the end of genocide, as you well know. Genocide has occurred in many other contexts. And the frustration in, in the 1990s, when 800,000 people were killed in Rwanda and Burundi, and essentially the international community did nothing. It's in the context of that, the aftermath of that, and the personal responsibility that the Secretary General Kofi Annan felt, that this concept of the responsibility to protect, R2P, was articulated. And it basically said that we can't simply, as an international community, stand still and allow vast numbers of population, vast numbers of people, to simply be slaughtered by various governments, their own or another, for political purposes. So even though the concept of it, the responsibility to protect had been framed quite carefully, the, the problem was it allowed plenty of room for those who wanted to use it in their own guise. So Syria, for instance, used it in Lebanon much before the concept was framed, and various other states have tried to use it. And certainly what you have in the Bahraini context is an attempt to suggest that what is in fact happening is the Saudis responding to their responsibility to protect Bahrain. Once again, I would stress to you that there is a distinction to be made between protecting a government and protecting a people. And that distinction has to be kept uppermost in your mind. Because this concept of responsibility to protect and humanitarian intervention has never been designed to protect a government and has been designed to protect a people. The United Nations Charter makes it very clear that it's we, the peoples of the UN, it's not we, the states of the United Nations, it's we, the peoples of the United Nations. So the key in understanding and in really refuting this argument that what has occurred in Bahrain is an intervention, is really lies in the concept of saying, well, who is this so-called intervention protecting? Is it protecting ordinary Bahraini citizens? Or is it protecting a government? And that's the point at which we need to question and ask these, ask these, raise these and scrutinize these issues in much greater detail. A final point I want to make to you in terms of international law and its perception is really the notion of the right to peace. The right to peace is not framed in particular legal terms, but it forms the undercarriage of everything that is occurring in the international society and the attempt to eradicate violence. We as an international society, as an international community, have a duty to individuals, human beings everywhere, to try and ensure that we can create peaceful conditions in which they can pursue their lives. We have failed in that particular, that particular constraint quite dramatically. In some instances, we see that the right to peace is upheld. Very often it's upheld when it suits the political motivations of the states that want to uphold it. But on other occasions, the right to peace is violated quite easily, and we allow populations and peoples to fall victim to police forces and security forces. And nothing, nothing exemplifies this more than the contrasting situations of Bahrain and Syria at the moment. So in understanding what the right to peace is, 
we need to really understand what the role of protest is. It's very clear that in many societies, there has not been a tradition of protest. This has been particularly true all across the Middle East, where protest has, for the last five or six decades, been put down very harshly by regimes who are insecure and who see protest as undermining their own, that their own power. We need to understand that protest is an important part of political life and that protest is an important part of political process. And unless we understand that particular notion and take strong measures to protect protesters and bring them to negotiating tables, we will never ever get anywhere near the right to peace. The fact is that in the last two years, what we have seen is growing protest. And I want to just finish by giving you a bit of context to what I see here. Essentially, when I write about these issues, I write about it from the perspective of right of self-determination. And essentially, I look at this, the world and look at the 84 or 80% 80, 80 of states that really have come out of decolonization and ask the question, have they really truly decolonized? Have they truly come out of this process and have we heard the voice of the people? In the, un in the case of some states, the answer is yes. Decolonization did take place and power was handed to the people. But in many contexts, and especially in the Middle East, that is not the case. We are for the first time hearing the voices of people who have been long disenfranchised. It is really vital that we listen carefully as an international community and respond with tact and with sophistication to the protests that are going on. If we end up in a scenario where once again there are these, these genuine voices of protest are drowned out by our support for states, we will once again lose the opportunity to win the peace. We've lost many wars, but it's crucial that we win the peace. And the only way we can win the peace is by making sure that those who protest and tell us and articulate what it is they want are given a fair hearing and are heard for what it is that they are asking. If we allow these, these peaceful protests, and that's, that's true as much in Madrid and in Occupy London as it is true in, in Pearl Square, if we drown out the genuine voice of protest and we allow power once again to dictate how the states go forward, we will have lost a major historical opportunity to get peace and to get self-determination across the world. So I would urge you once again to bear in mind these important legal concepts when we think about the events of two years ago. It is really quite shocking that there is so little coverage of the issues that occur in Bahrain. I don't need to tell you that this is really a great and gross reflection of the extent to which realpolitik plays a role in our understanding of law and our understanding of human rights. I speak to you as an, as an independent observer. I speak to you as somebody who believes in processes of law and believes that processes of law should be applied everywhere equally irrespective of who the perpetrators are. Essentially, the role of law has always been to try and gain rationality to power. If we allow power to defeat law, and if we allow power to defeat rights, then we don't have a legal order. For me, it's crucial that we maintain an international legal order, and it's crucial that that international legal order is upheld in every single case, even when the most powerful are involved. And so I would urge you to continue protesting and struggling I wish that international law could give you better weapons and better tools to maintain your struggle with. But unfortunately, the only thing we can do at this stage is to continue to speak out and highlight violations when they occur. That in and of itself has a value because that in and of itself will tell our offspring and our children and future generations that what occurred and what continues to occur in, Bar in Bahrain is a shocking violation of public international law. And it is the duty of the international community to step up and uphold the laws and order it claims to protect. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Castellino. Thank you. It's my pleasure to welcome our third uh, speaker this evening, Mr. Uh, Jawad Farouz, is a former member of the Bahraini Parliament with the Al Wafaq bloc. He was an outspoken critic of the regime. Uh, he was arrested, tortured, and sentenced to uh, uh, to jail. Subsequently, his nationality was revoked along with 30 other Bahrainis, and he formerly worked as an electrical engineer with the Bahrain 
the Electricity Board. We welcome you and invite you to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, exactly this moment, at this moment, on 13 March 2011, exactly I can say at this moment, so these troops started coming in Bahrain to the King's Fight case well. Yes, it has officially been announced to be on 14, but at this moment, uh, I noticed that one because we were watching and observing the movement of the troops uh, within the, the case way in Bahrain. It was between 7.15 to 7.30 on 13 March 2011. This invasion, I think, it is unique in many ways that I can show a certain slides to see how the moment started and what are the sequence of the events and was it a legitimate invasion internationally, even locally, even within GCC legislations, even with the uh, uh, defense uh, agreements within the GCC countries, was it uh, within this bylaw or not? You know, the le geographical location of Bahrain is very important to the international community, to the United States, United Kingdom, and definitely, definitely for the neighbor of Bahrain, Saudi Arabia. And as you know, uh, on 1986, they built this bridge, a caseway between Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. And this uh, caseway is not just an economical uh, 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 need or requirement for Bahrain. I think it was more than that. It was a uh, political uh, requirement for Bahrain, which we seen it uh, in 2011. This is first night when the people started to gather around the Pier Randabors. It was in 15 February. The announcement was that they should get together on 14 of February, but they couldn't reach only on 15 they arrived. This, this was the first night of the Pier Randabors. Yes, they attacked on 17 February they attacked the people while they're sleeping in the early morning, and they took control. Who took control? Bahrain Defense Forces and police uh, guards, or well, national guards, they took control over the uh, period around the world on 17 February 2011. But they couldn't stay long. Why? Because people resisted, and people mobilized themselves once again. They came out on demonstration. On 18 February, they started mobilized, and on 19 exactly, a huge demonstration started, and they got toward the pier around the world where tanks, you can see in the top photos, tanks uh, were there, but they continued going there where this guy, or shirtless, he martyred when he been uh, directly hit by the uh, uh, defense forces directly and he been martyred on, on the spot. Uh, if possible, the light, you can make it uh, here, the light, the photos could be shown. I think on that day, on 17 February 2011, the decision was taken that the authority should deal with the crisis, with the revolution, and two plans, plan A and plan B. Both plans, I think, they got in parallel, not in sequence. What are they? I think the plan A was to have contact with the opposition and try to buy time to let them to be engagement on what's so-called during that time, a dialogue with the Crown Prince. But I think they were not serious about that dialogue. They want to buy time to act on plan B. What was the plan B? Plan B, to let the Saudi troops come in as soon as possible. Everyone knows that you cannot take such important military decision and implement it right away. I don't think so, and I think it's not logic. 
that on 13 or 14 of March 2011, the decision has been taken and the same day, same moment, all these troops come in Bahrain. It requires certain, a long time to make a mobilization, to make an agreement, even though this action should be informed United States mainly and UK. Why United States? Because they have fifth fleet in Bahrain. UK, because with their special contact, diplomatic contacts with Bahrain, I think all has been arranged within a month time. When they pulled back from the roundabout exactly on 19, after this gentleman being martyred, we could see after that, we could see that the people stayed there from 19 till this day, which was on 13th of March. 13th of March, then it was indication that there are certain movement there from the security forces, and they want once again for second time to attack the roundabout. They took an excuse when certain a number of the demonstrators they gathered near the financial harbor and blocked the area that time. Exactly, it was morning around five o'clock in the morning. Uh, uh, they been attacked by police forces, and there was a call that everyone should go to the fair roundabout. And that point clashes started and the people start coming toward the pearl roundabout. Here, beginning of the clashes on 13th of March. The gather started here once again. In this stage, so many people are standing. The first one was addressing and directing the, all the demonstrator was Sheikh Muhammad Habib. I was next to him in the stage. I was standing there. And it was around 10.30, all police forces were there in the bridge, which is uh, 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 controlling all the area, and the people were down, and Sheikh Hamad Habib gave a warning to the security forces that by within half an hour, if they don't leave the scene, he will ask all the demonstrators to go up and try to uh, control even the bridge, which has been controlled by the security forces. And that's exactly happened before the, 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 the deadline of the time, the police forces and all security forces start to leaving the scene. Here you can see part of the clashes started here and police forces still no military act being made during that time. Why? Because the security guards, police station, police forces, they were few in numbers during that time. I think it was a moment that they found it is right time <coughs> to ask the Saudis to start coming in, although the plan is being made earlier one month back. They said the same time, the same day. That day, there was an urgent meeting in one of the opposition's headquarters, al Fakir's quarter. I was attending that meeting too. This meeting is joining the loyal groups and the opposition groups, discussing what they can do what happened that day, and how they can deal with the Crown Prince offer to start a dialogue or not. Opposition standed on their requirements that any dialogue should guarantee two things. One, that the people in the round of world should be safe, should be guaranteed they are safe, not be attacked. Secondly, that a council to be elected, or a referendum that it will lead to a new constitution a new agreement, uh, a contractual agreement between the, 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 the ruling family and the people. But the loyal group didn't agree with us. It exactly when it reached between 720 to 725, when we hear that the Swedish troops is starting coming in Bahrain, they told us while we were in the meeting, and I think the loyal groups were so happy during that event, but oppositions, they were so sad. This is last night in the Pearl Rendezvous before the attack and before any scene of the uh, 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 Sudanese troops coming in. Last night. This is, you know, this Prince Naif bin Abdul Aziz. He was the main uh, man in Saudi Arabia who was in contact with the ruling family in Bahrain to uh, 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 plan all this uh, uh, Saudi 
occupation of Bahrain, and I think he was supporting it so uh, strongly, I think he was behind it. Saudis started coming. They started coming through the his way, and it's been uh, 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 all over the international media covering it. You can see the sign that's like they are coming for a victory. Then the next day, it comes to the early morning 16, 16 of March, when the officials in Bahrain, authorities in Bahrain, announced the emergency law or martial law. Then in early morning, around 6 o'clock, the uh, helicopters and military airplanes are starting to attack the Perrandeville. And you can see gradually the tanks came in, starting attacking. All the tanks mobilized in different locations. All security combined with the uh, uh, all military uh, equipment mobilized themselves. Then they start attacking. The people during that time were in lower in quantity because the martial laws already a night uh, uh, earlier has been announced and the people, they knew that they cannot resist uh, that much and the people started to leave the scene. See, instead of pro protecting the properties, they damaged all the cars next to the period roundabout parking. This all been damaged by the uh, military supported by Saudi invasion. This is the stage. It's been totally damaged the stage in the Perlandevo. Then they cleared the scene. The police forces, meantime, back with the Saudi troops, they cleared the scene and started to demolish the Perlandevo. That day, to guarantee that the people are not going back to the Perlandevo and not resisting the presence of the uh, military in the Perlandevo, what they done, they attacked different areas in Bahrain, different villages, to let the people defend their areas and not taking any uh, defense or attacking military prison in the Pirandabot. And one of the clear examples of the area was Sitra. Here, the Sitra, <coughs> this martyr, Ahmed Farhan, has been blown his head so clearly, was so unhuman. At the same time, they start demolishing the area around the world. And all international media start to cover it. And I think somehow they were fair to say that there is a hypocritic democracy in the international community. The Bahrain's revolution started in 14, but Libya started after two, three days back. And it was so clear that there is a very ununderstandable way that they dealt with the Libyan revolution during that time and the way they dealt with the Bahrain revolution. They fully supported the uh, 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 uprising in, in, or revolution in Libya and against that they support the regime in Bahrain who is oppressing the, 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 the people who demanded the, uh, their uh, freedom and it was so ununderstandable, and even the national media, they, they made a, such clear comparison between uh, how they are acting there and how acting in Bahrain. You can see different international media they supported, but the people, although there was a martial law, but the people didn't accept it and start resisting. Many, many international media they covered it. See, the target was not just to control or let the people be away from the peer around the world. The target was certain sectarian attack on all those who are seeking uh, a change in the country, seeking the freedom, seeking a real uh, a democratic state instead to be under a dictatorship monarchy. Then what they done to impose certain division within the Bahrainis community with different sects they start attacking mosques and religious centers. All these locations shows that all the mosques related to the one sect of 
uh, religion that Shia has been attacked more than 40 <coughs> locations. It's all under Saudi's uh, coverage, Saudi support. Some of them is related to the 500 days back were being demolished. Although officially they are being registered in the, uh, all the records, the, 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 the records of the government that they are a legitimate uh, mosque. As, as I said, people they didn't accept and they resisted and even the location of this mosque started to get gathered and pray. The Sionist report, I think it was so important to see that if the international community want to put a real pressure on the regime, they can do so. And I think this is a clear example. I believe that the regime didn't want any intervention from the international community to impose an independent commission to find out and to make an inquiry but they accept it under the pressure from the United Kingdom and the United States. So this is a clear case if they want that to make a pressure on the current regime to be more democratic and to hand over the power to the people they can. So there are some positive about this uh, uh, report that's indicated that there is no intervention. For, for, uh, first of all, there's no intervention from uh, outside countries like Iran and the crisis in Bahrain, and secondly, all these human, right, uh, human rights uh, violations already been recorded and was so clear. Uh, many clear positions from different media. This is, I think, my colleague already mentioned that. If, uh, uh, I, I can mention here about this uh, declaration of the granting of independence of the colonial countries, how it's been clearly uh, 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 written and been implemented in so many parts of the international uh, countries that this is to be uh, 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 this is to be respected under the United Nations but unfortunately it's not been implemented in Bahrain when there is a colony and when there is a tax. Today Bahrain is under Saudi's occupation all arguments to justify giving up sovereignty to the Saudis have been challenged and invalid because people from that day up to now daily they are in the street they are uh, 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 they are protesting uh, uh, day by day the Saudis should withdraw their troops I think this is out of question that they should remain even a small number of what they claim that they, they are just protecting the major uh, ministries or major geographic location barrens so unacceptable totally, then Saudis have to apologize and pay compensation for the human and material destructions which they have caused to the people of Bahrain. Thank you very much. Mr. Farris, thank you very much for your presentation. We now have an opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, my request would be that you uh, give your name first, your name. Secondly, you indicate who you're directing the question to. And then thirdly, you give your question. Please make sure there's a question mark at the end of the sentence. And if you need to take a breath, the sentence is too long. Position in law is it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a question based on how certain powerful states interpreted this, and I think that needs to be highlighted. That in a sense, the answer to your question should be one thing, but the answer to your question is not that because of po the politics of power. In the context of self-determination, such as I believe this situation exists, <coughs> the Bahrainis have the right to resist, and the international community has a duty to either investigate what that right to resist means or to somehow broker a dialogue between those who are resisting and the power. The difficulty that you're highlighting, which is very true and explains quite a lot about why this issue has not made the international headlines on a regular basis, is really all to do with the extent to which powerful states have very good enemies who are equally powerful. So this question is, is in a sense, not really a question of law, it's a question of politics. As far as the law is concerned, the position is very clear. 
that it says in many, the declaration that my colleague put up there, the Declaration on the Independence of Colonial Countries, makes it very clear that there is a right to self-determination and that by virtue of that right, people across the world have the, the right to stand up and explain when their rights are being violated and the international community has a duty to somehow work to uphold that right. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that any use of force is permissible. There are rules. Obviously, the legal system suggests that you can't use Ill illegal force, but you have to balance that aspect too against the new force that's being used. Uh, the emphasis has to always lie on the Pacific Settlement of Disputes. That's very clear in the context of the United Nations Charter, and the, the first duty falls on the United Nations Security Council, which, as you've pointed out, has two of these powerful friends of a powerful enemy of Bahrain at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Second question. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. It's working. Right. Um, okay. Um, I have a question for uh, Dr. Madawi and another one for Dr. Professor Madawi and Professor Joshua. Professor is higher than doctor. And uh, uh, just a few years ago, I was performing an Umrah in a uh, pilgrimage, and I was I was I was just praying, and and uh, after after my my pray, someone came you know with a long beard and told me you have to. Your, your prayer is, is wrong, you have to do it, to perform it again. I said, why? Because uh, he said, you know what? There is a hadith from uh, Prophet Muhammad saying, three things, if, if they came in front of you, then your prayer is wrong. It is, if, if, if three things, the donkeys, black dogs, and women. These things, if, if they came in front of you, now, in Bahrain, uh, as, as we just said, uh, seen a slide, in paragraph 952 of the Basuni BICI report, they say that uh, uh, the, the uh, Bahia al Aradi was shot by a member of Saudi force uh, because, she, she, uh, you know, uh, because she was a woman driving a car in Bahrain. And exactly that, that, was, that was written there. Uh, now, and, and we've seen lots of hatred after that, like Saudis backing uh, to, to just uh, demolish mosques, and on on on, on at the and others, they were the, the Saudi soldiers were were, were disturbing all the hatred against the Shias, calling them the Majus, the whatever. Do you think these these acts were uh, individual acts? I mean, some soldiers were, were preferring that, or it is it is a policy of, by 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 the by the whole, the whole the whole army. This is a question for uh, Professor. Uh, for for just yeah. one one question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just 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 if, if you may, may allow me, uh, do you think that okay in the in the in, uh, while Saudi Arabia condemned uh, 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 the invitation of of the Soviet forces into Afghanistan 1979 uh, by, by Barbara Karman and Saudis to condemn presence of, of, of Syrians in, 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 in Lebanon and also United States and United Kingdom. Do you think that, 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 that there is a devil standard here? Why, why, why do you think they, they condemn here and they, they will not condemn the, the Saudis being, being in Bahrain? Thank you very much. Well, uh, I must uh, confess that uh, I have a very uncomfortable feeling of being part of the occupying force. <laughs> but I hope you all recognize uh, that uh, so, uh, so called people we call Saudis are themselves under occupation. <laughs> and some people actually believe that. Uh, it is. Uh, now, to just go back to your question, whether uh, these kind of incidents are individual acts or systematic uh, acts. Well, I mean, uh, there is a long history uh, of uh, discrimination against uh, not only the Shia. Uh, one thing that we have to remember, and I keep saying that, that before the Saudi regime prosecuted the Shia, it prosecuted the Sunnis. Uh, uh, well, I'm a Sunni, and my family and my region were regarded as blasphemous kafir. So before they unleashed their power on the Shia of the Eastern Province, they actually practiced the discrimination against Sunnis. 
Uh, and until the present day, there are, uh, for example, Sydney uh, madhabs. Um, you know, if you remember, if you know, Mecca was a very uh, um, cosmopolitan area where all the Sunni madhabs were represented. And what they did was to actually sideline all of the others with the exception of the Hanbalis. And therefore, um, you know, the discrimination is there. Um, and uh, when it comes to the Shia, they have the added discrimination because they are for the majority, unfortunately, of the uh, people in that rule in Saudi Arabia, they are the uh, blasphemous other. Uh, they are not, uh, they are even, you know, one would say that, uh, I, I was a bit worried recently, uh, especially when the eastern province was actually uh, um, mobilized, and uh, so far there are 16 uh, Shia uh, activists who had been shot by the regime. And even today, this morning, we received photographs of uh, Awamiya and Qatif being almost uh, under siege under siege with the troops that you described, uh, uh, Mr. Ferouz, uh, almost the same situation across the bridge. But not only across the bridge, in the heartland of the so-called Wahhabi Arabia, in Qasim itself, you see the same images. And therefore, uh, the Saudi regime feels agitated, and it's under, uh, uh, it, it feels the challenge of the development that have taken. It used the sectarian card. It denounced the Shia, whether in Bahrain or in the eastern province or in Lebanon or even the pilgrims who come as people who are outside Islam, basically. And this is this is well known, documented in various fatwas. Um, now uh, the, the question is, how do we resist that? Uh, the, the power, unfortunately, is on their. They have the power, but I don't believe that you know sheer power and oppression is going to work. Because fortunately, for the first time uh, last week, when uh, women in Qasim were demonstrating in, su in support of their political prisoners, we saw for the first time uh, bridges between the Shia in the eastern province who went out to support them. And also, there were some messages from the central part of Saudi Arabia thanking the Shia. The Saudi regime tries to block any national politics. By national politics, I mean politics that cross the sectarian divide. So anybody who sympathizes with Shia when they are shot in the eastern province or in Bahrain uh, are regarded as traitors, and I'm one of them. Uh, I'm regarded as somebody who is uh, you know, just sold out, basically, because simply I don't fall into the sectarian uh, narrative that we are all one. But in a way, as well, uh, the Shia in Saudi Arabia, well, they have been uh, asking for national issues to be just part of the nation, so-called nation. But it hasn't happened, and they are always sidelined. But there are people who are working on bridging that divide. Whether they will succeed in the current climate, I think it is very, very difficult. But there are young voices who actually do not fall into the sectarian um, you know, uh, pockets that they want the population to, to fall in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dweef answer the question is yes, it is hypocrisy. And yes, it is double standards. And I think that's one of the, the, the biggest irony of all of this, of course, is that these are states like Britain and the United States of America who are prescribing democracy who are asking for the rule of law, but are unwilling to apply those same standards, which they have mostly built, to their friends. So, absolutely, it is hypocrisy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Frank Gelly. Um, question for um, uh, Professor Castellino, but also it links up with um, the end of the speech of Professor um, Rashid, because um, when she said that she can't see the Saudi troops out of Bahrain very soon, I wanted to pick up on this um, concept. Uh, uh, you, Professor Castellino, have mentioned this twice, uh, real politique, which in a way I'm going to be devil's advocate and say that in a way, I mean, it's been implied, but basically trumps international law. 
uh, that in fact international law only plays a rhetorical or a moral uh, role, whereas in fact at the end of the day it is real politic, in which especially Britain plays a very sinister role, because Britain was the colonial power which occupied Bahrain for well over a century. And I'm going to be even more controversial, uh, the role played by the British royal family vis-a-vis -vis the Gulf monarchies is also pretty sinister. Prince Charles is now in uh, Jordan and shed crocodile tears of the refugees from uh, Syria. But what about the victims, the people in Bahrain? Is he going also to Bahrain? Uh, so here we got some glaring contradictions. So I wonder if, um, uh, you know, can, can we really say, can we really hope international law apart from a rhetorical tool? Um, thank you for that question. I mean, it's, it's one of these strange things that when you work in areas of public international law, most often you're called upon to defend that it exists uh, because people see this. But let me just put it to you this way. There are rules in this country against murder and there are rules in this country against theft. Murder and theft nonetheless still occur. Does that mean there is no rule on murder and theft? And does that mean that the most powerful win? Now you will say to me, well, yeah, murder and theft occur, but we have a system through which we can prosecute it. That's and it. I will say to you that what happened in Iraq, the illegal invasion of Iraq, was murder on a large scale that has gone unprosecuted. So essentially what I'm trying to say to you is, yes, real politik has always played a role, and the powerful have always created systems that essentially uphold their power. But when you look at this from a broader scale of history, not just decades, look at this in the context of centuries, you will find law prevails. And the reason that law prevails is because people like you and others in this room will stand up and highlight the violation. Now, that's not good enough, I agree. It's not good enough for the children who are dying today. It's not good enough for the generations who have lost their livelihood today. But there is a, the, the law still offers the only hope we have. Essentially, international law is a set of rules that we have agreed are the basis of our civilization. If we start allowing these rules to be broken by the powerful, then we go back to what we always had. What we had was the law of the jungle. The strongest and the most powerful always wins. We don't need to create rules around that. We already know that that exists. So it's, it's our role, and certainly it's my role as someone who works in this field, to keep highlighting the violations. You might say, what's the point of having the, the International Court of Justice talk about the, the illegal wall, the apartheid wall in Israel and Palestine? What's the point? Well, the point is we know what is right and wrong in law. And we will put that down as a record in history. We might not be able to change it in the short term, but that doesn't mean we give up and simply say, you know what, actually, you're right. It's just politics. Why don't we just give up and go home and accept it? And generations of activists, generations of very, very brave people have brought us to this point in time. And they will get us there again. South Africa did fall. You know, there, there are these changes that occur. It doesn't happen quickly enough. So I always say, don't give up your quest for international justice, but moderate your expectations on how it will occur. Thank you very much indeed for that answer. We have time for one more question, and then we're going to watch a short film. Yes. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Zaid Alisa. I'm a political analyst and a writer. Now, it is becoming increasingly who, apparent. Who is your question? The question is to Professor Madawi. It is becoming increasingly apparent that the Saudi invasion and occupation of Bahrain has spectacularly failed in quelling the protests and placating the just demands of the people. It has also spectacularly backfired by, uh, by sparking the very protest that the regime wanted to prevent, that is in the eastern province. But isn't it the case now that the popular uprising in Saudi Arabia have managed to surmount the Saudi re regime's impregnable shield, which is sectarian divisions? It is this very support, by wholehearted support by the Saudi regime to dictators, to secular regimes that have laid bare and expo exposed the patently deceitful myth that it is the guardian and defender of Sunni, uh, defender of Sunni Islam. So that support has exposed the regime in the very eyes of the Saudi people. And that's why the Saudi uh, people and the uprising have uh, basically uh, reached the heartlands of Saudi Arabia. Wouldn't uh, you agree? So, thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, I do agree. But, uh, you know, 
there, there isn't really anything I could add to this. Uh, but I mean, the, the problem is, yes, they moved their troop, and it is a support uh, supporting the rulers of Bahrain, and this is what they are doing. It doesn't mean that people are stop demonstrating. Uh, they have they haven't stopped demonstrating in Saudi Arabia, let alone in Bahrain, with its longer history in political mobilization. So they, you know, they, they, the troops can move, but this doesn't mean that people stop protesting. Uh, you know that. The only problem I see in Bahrain is, uh, it's, it's, as I said earlier, it's an international context. And it's a very small place, very small population. And how much can the Bahraini population take in terms of people you know, being shot all the time? It's a very small population. Unfortunate for Bahrain, it is surrounded by Big Brother. <coughs> Thank you. We, I'm going to have to... Um, curtail the questions at this time. Uh, I want to thank Professor Madawi al-Rashid, Professor Joshua Castellino, and Mr. Jawad Farouz. Let's express our appreciation for their <laughs> There will be time for more questions on a one-to-one -one basis after the meeting formally closes, uh, but we are now going to uh, watch a short film. Please stay, uh, it will only take uh, six, seven minutes, and then we'll go downstairs for dinner. Tunisia and Egypt 
the Saudis would not allow one in their own backyard. In an unprecedented move, the GCC Peninsula Shield Force, a joint military of the six Gulf states, would be used to control citizens of the Gulf. Bahrain declared martial law and called it a state of national safety. Down in Bahrain. 
Saudi Arabia. Thank you very much. Uh, it's finished now, and please uh, join us downstairs.